welcome to another episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? I hope this isn't your first time joining us, but if it is, I am Karen E. Osborne, author of Getting It Right, Tangled Lies, which came out in July, so it's been a whole month out in the world, and next June, uh, Reckonings will be out, so I'm very excited about that. And I'm equally excited about my guest today. I want you to meet Mary Ann Noe. And I want to tell you a little bit about her, and then she will tell you all about herself. All right. So um, Mary Ann is a photographer. And if you go on her website, which she will tell you about, you can see her beautiful, beautiful photography. She is also a blogger, an author of short stories, essays, poetry, and now her latest um, venture is her first novel, and it's called To Know Her. And it's really interesting, very interesting premise. I think you're going to enjoy it. Welcome, welcome, Marianne. Thank you so much, Karen, and congratulations on your book, by the way. Thank Great. you. Yes, exciting times, right? So tell me a little bit about what kind of reader you were when you oh were a child, what did I, you I love would, reading? I would go to the library and I heard one of your other interviewees say that she would check out seven books because that's all you could check out. That's the same with our library. And I'd start walking home and we had a beautiful park along the river. I'd sit down and read a whole book mm. I got home. And then I'd get so upset because I've read this. Why am I carrying it all the way home? <laughs> <laughs> But my mother read everything I did too. And she said that was one of the things she really missed when I moved to college because she didn't have any books coming into the house from the library anymore. She had a card so she could pick it up anyway. But so I read um, under the covers at night. I read, you know, everywhere I could, I could get my hands on books. When I started teaching, I said, I don't have time to read. And I, I taught for a number of years before it dawned on me, duh, you're an English teacher. What are you doing? So I made 10 minutes every night to start with. And suddenly now it's, I, I inhale books again. Mm. So that's- Was there a book as a child that, ha that had a big impression on you or has affected you as a writer? When I was really young, I loved the Beverly Cleary books because they really spoke to me. Um, uh, so I, I kind of mourned her recently when she died. I haven't read anything by her for years and years and years, but, um, and I love mysteries. So Agatha Christie kind of grew up with me and I still love mysteries. Um, I have gone on to, I like Jeffrey Deaver's work because they are so fast paced. And I like some of the Scandahuvian writers. Uh, they're kind of dark, but that's okay. You know, it, um, and there are a lot of other books I read now too. So those are some that carried me forward carried you forward, all right. And uh, tell us a little bit about your artistic journey. You know, you're this essayist, blogger, photographer, poet, and now you're a novelist. What, what was that journey like? Well, I come from a long line of fine arts people. My, my grandmother wrote poetry. I never knew her, but I, I saw a few of her poetries. Um, I had an uncle who was an architect. My dad was a tool and die maker. So those fine tuned things and loved classical music. So I grew up with all of that stuff. Um, but my journey really started out as I was sure I was going to win the Pulitzer Prize in literature. Because <laughs> the first thing I started writing when I was maybe eight or nine was, it was you're gonna hear this. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and the clock struck midnight, bong, bong, bong. And I got about to the fourth bong and I gave up and I thought, okay, well, there goes the Pulitzer Prize in literature. <laughs> <laughs> but high school, high school and college, I did a lot of poetry and um, never anything really longer. And then when I was teaching towards the end of my career, I started writing some longer things and that's where the novels came in, so. Mm. So you've written this really interesting, uh, kind of an unusual approach, um, this book that you're, this novel that you've written. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. It started like- and show, show us this beautiful book. Look at that. To know her. Yes. Um, it started out when I was teaching, 
I said to my students, I am so tired of reading about dysfunctional families and dysfunctional teens. And the biggest football player in the room stood up and cheered. And I thought, oh, I'm on the right track then. <laughs> so I, I showed them bits and pieces of this when I first started writing it. And um, they, they said, yes, that's really true to form. But it was, it's about a normal 18 year old girl who was in a coma because of a car accident with her boyfriend. And her parents get all the stuff in, from that accident in the garbage bags, a, a big garbage bag. And they start going through it and they go, oh yeah, this is Juliana, this is our daughter. And then they find things like this, mm. you know, a miniature whiskey bottle or a wine bottle that fits in a purse and a condom and they can't explain any of that. But the reader, because it has two voices, the, um, the parents and then Juliana, you get the backstory of how she acquired all this stuff. Um, they throw some things away that they don't think are important and the reader no discovers, oh yeah, they were very important. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, and as I was writing, the parents, Will and Susan started talking to me and saying, look, one said, I don't want to withdraw life support. And the other one said, yes, we, yes, we have to do this because she's in a coma. She's not going to come out of this. And that out of that, con I had to write that conflict in because they told me if you're trying to, to ignore this, it's not going to work. You have to write this in. So it's it's turned into a crossover novel that appeals to both adults and teens. So I love um, it. I love the concept of it. And it's so cool that you say that your characters talk to you. Uh, my audience knows that I have mentioned this before, but that's how my characters talk to me and they have arguments with me and they say, pay attention to me. And, and it's quite, we're quite odd, don't you think? We're, it is, but you know, that's, that's true of so many authors. And um, my books are mainly character driven, mm. I think, right? Yeah, because I'm interested in people and, and how they're gonna react to things and such. Um, so how can, how can it help but not have a voice inside your head or two or three or four? Or two or three, yes. You know, they're some of my best friends. <laughs> exactly exactly so i thought it would be lovely if you would read an excerpt for our audience just so they get a a sense of the story is that something you could do you betcha okay that's that's i'm in wisconsin so that's a wisconsin saying you betcha all right so um this is a chapter where um will the father has gone to the hospital to be with his daughter and his wife's not there. So his daughter is in the hospital bed in a coma. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the piece I picked, does, his wife is there. They're looking at her. Okay. So Susan lifted Juliana's hospital gown away from her hip. Look, she said, stepping to one side, but holding the gown so Juliana's smooth skin was exposed. Will bit the inside of his cheek, anticipating some awful unknown, but what he saw made him laugh. There on Juliana's right hip in all her glory was a small tattoo of Minnie the Mouse. <laughs> Do you think this is funny? Susan's voice was unbelieving. A tattoo, did you know about this? She let the gown fall back into place. The nurses put sheets in place and left the room. No, of course not, I didn't know. Will was quick to reassure knowing Susan would be furious if she thought Juliana told him about the tattoo and not told her or worse, if he knew all along and deliberately did not share it with her. He said to keep that subject from coming up, when on earth did she get that? He laughed again, kind of cute, don't you think? Cute, cute? Susan's voice betrayed concern more than anger. When did she do this? Why didn't she tell us? Probably figured we'd cut her out of the will, Will joke. <laughs> Quite quickly at Susan, wondering how she'd take it. But Susan had her hands up to her mouth and didn't respond. Instead, Susan reached out to touch Juliana's hair, shifting a few loose strands off her face and running her fingers along her cheek. Susan shook her head and turned to Will. Did she think we'd disapprove? Was she afraid of us? No, Will said. I'm sure she just figured it was easier not to tell us. That way she didn't have to worry whether we'd yell at her or not. You can't even see it when she's dressed. Even through underpants? It wouldn't show uh, through underpants? Susan seemed to look for acceptance, for acknowledgement that this was normal for an 18-year-old girl. Will could give her that, even if he had no idea if it truly was normal. He knew tattoos seemed to be the rage now, but he saw them mostly on what they used to call the wild crowd. Their Juliana certainly didn't qualify for that label. Ah, 
Kids get tattoos all the time, he said to Susan. This is nothing. Look where it is, on her hip. It's not like she was flaunting it or something. It's not a skull or snake or worse, just a cute little mini mouse. She probably got mini because it reminded her of our trip to Disney World, remember? Susan's face relaxed. She smiled. Yeah, that was a great trip. I remember all she wanted to do was have her picture taken with Minnie Mouse. Mini, mini, mini. That's all she talked about for weeks afterwards. She carried that photo around everywhere. You must be right. But her face clouded. Of course I am. Will stepped in before Susan had a chance to go on. Just a reminder of good times. But I still don't get it. Why didn't she tell us? I can't believe we never saw it, never suspected. Did you hear her talk about a tattoo? I wonder who else knows about this. Does Katie? Will forestalled what he saw as her next question. No, we're not gonna ask Katie. Katie has enough on her mind right now. She doesn't need us prying into their lives together. It's only a tattoo, Susan. It's not that important. Maybe not, Susan said, turning to Juliana and curling her fingers around Juliana's. But first the bottle, now this tattoo, what else don't we know? Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, one of the things we like to do before I let you go is ask about books that you've read recently that you really enjoyed. So you mentioned a couple of authors that you like, but I wondered if there was a book that you might recommend to our, our audience. Oh, there's some really good ones. Um, too many, of course, but here's a few. Uh, William Kent Kruger wrote a book called This Tender Land, uh, and it takes place in Minnesota and along the Minnesota River and the Mississippi River. And it's kind of a combo of the Odyssey and Huck Finn. And mm -hmm. he does such a wonderful job. He's a Minnesota author, so he's, he knows his characters and he knows his land and is nice. Um, anything by Eric Larson, I love. Um, the rec most recent one I read was The Splendid and the Vile about um, Winston Churchill. Um, and I like Jodi Picoult, so every once in a while I'll pick yeah. up yeah, yeah. things because she picks such interesting themes, mm. such interesting topics. Uh, so that's, that's always a fun one. Um, Barbara King Solver is one of my favorites with the yeah. Poison Bibles. That is just a super, super book. That I would agree with you. That was one of the things I loved, loved about that book was how you always knew who was speaking. Yes. And she didn't have to tell you. Yes. You know, she, she got the voices so yeah. perfectly. And they were all different. It was such a great yeah. insight into how people saw Africa at the time. Uh, different ways of looking at the same place and seeing entirely different things. Um, yeah. It really, really was so well different, written. Different eyes. It's one of the it's one of the wonderful, wonderful books. I um, one of the lessons that I learned about p readers and readers' taste is I gave an early copy of my first novel to a book club, just mm -hmm. just for feedback, just to help you know it wasn't polished yet it wasn't so they read it and they invited me to come and about half of them loved it and half of them didn't love it and they were arguing with each other about why the girl did this and this one did that so I listened and I, I felt like an author and then I said well what else have you read and I said oh we just finished um uh Barbara Kingslover what is it called the Poisonwood Bible Bible. Yeah. Yeah. So we just finished that. And I said, Oh, what'd you guys think? Half of them loved it and half of them didn't. So I thought, okay, I'm okay then, because this was clearly an amazing book. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if everybody likes it, you have I don't think you've done your job. Because mm. part, part of what I want to do as a writer is to stir the pot, you know, to to say. Oh, I've had people say to me, oh, I hate Will or I hate Susan. I just don't get it. You know, I, oh, I just, they're so nasty. <laughs> and it's like, yes, good. That's what I wanted. I want a reaction. Yes. And to have them discuss your characters like they are real people, which yes. they are, which yes. they are. <laughs> I do. <laughs> if our audience would like to learn more about you, see your beautiful art, um, find out about you, where can they find you? They can find me on my webpage, 
maryannnoe.com, all one word. Just be careful because you end up with three N's in a row, maryannnoe.com. And you can contact me through that. You can uh, order books that way. I, and, and of course, support your indie bookstores, but the books are also available on Amazon. Um, it's on a, a, a warehouse, I guess you could say, or a distributor's name. So every independent bookstore has access uh, to my book. So that, that's, those are good ways to get it. That is, and, and support your local independent bookstore. Excellent, yeah. excellent advice. I thank you so much. This has been such a delightful conversation. And I hope all of you will go out and buy Mary Ann Noe's book. If you can't buy it, you can borrow it. But we love, we authors love it when you buy our books. Absolutely. <laughs> and we'll see you next time at What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? Thanks for listening.